Hello. Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Damien Carell. I'm a creative lead at Google Design, based out of New York City. Um, Google Design, we are a cooperative team of designers, writers, and producers at Google whose primary focus is to support and promote uh, designers and their work both inside Google and beyond. One of the ways we do that is through our editorial output, uh, publishing articles regularly on design.google. Um, there we craft stories uh, like what it means to develop a brand system in VR or how we might approach voice user interface design. We also work closely with the material design team, a team dedicated to creating design guidelines, tools, and resources. These guidelines are a set of best-in-class principles for designing clear and beautiful UI, exploring everything from color, motion, iconography, and typography. We think of the work on material as more than just a system. Uh, it's also about seeking a deeper understanding of the workflow between design and engineering, design and technology, and developing tools that foster a healthier collaboration. And one of the tools um, one of the tools is our material components, which is a set of modular and customizable UI components for web, Android, and iOS. But one of, the, one of my favorite projects that we work on at Google Design is, is this one. It's, it's SPAN. Um, SPAN is our conference and talk series exploring connections and creative innovation in design and technology. As a word and a concept, SPAN suggests the distance between thumb and little finger, your, your hand span. It's a maker's measure. And to us, it signifies, our, <clears throat> it signifies our, our emphasis on the makers in the design and tech community. It also suggests the idea of spanning distances and bridging connections between practitioners from diverse areas of focus and even geographical locations. We've been hosting SPAN events since 2014, visiting cities that are particularly resonant with themes that we're curious about. Uh, this is our second trip to the UK as we hosted SPAN London in 2015. Last year we were in Tokyo and Los Angeles, and this year we're visiting three new cities, uh, Pittsburgh, Mexico City, and right here in Newcastle and Gateshead. There are always you know, different speakers and attendees and, and even different themes at our events, um, but always the same mission, to facilitate a dialogue within communities about art, science, and design and technology. Just three weeks ago, we hosted our, one of our larger events in Pittsburgh, um, where the thriving design, tech, and local maker community gathered for a two-day event of talks, demos, and workshops. Uh, similarly, for Newcastle and Gateshead, we're ex excited to tap into a city with strong industrial roots and an active and engaged tech and design scene. And also, like Pittsburgh, an impressive amount of bridges. Seriously, Pittsburgh has a lot of bridges. <laughs> Additionally, a, a tradition with um, these SPAN events is our um, annual SPAN Reader. This is the, this is the third volume. Um, there's a number of essays from our Pittsburgh speakers and contributors um, this year, uh, and you all should have one in your tote bag. Um, uh, if, if you don't have one, please grab one. There's uh, a number of really good essays. For this particular event, we partnered with SPAN alums, It's Nice That, to help host some of the most interesting talent here in uh, Newcastle and Gateshead. So without further ado, I'd like to invite It's Nice That's managing director, Alex Beck, to the stage to tell you more about tonight's program and get this evening properly started. Right, here we go. How are you all? You look very friendly. You look great, actually, all, good, all you guys. So I'm the director of It's Nice That, and I'm going to guide you through. First up, huge thank you all for coming on a Thursday night. It's been an amazing day, so we thought, I was going to say, on a rainy night, but it wasn't rainy. Um, we also thanks to the amazing Google Design for the support and making it happen, and obviously our beautiful surroundings at the Baltic. Um, before we start, I've got the exciting job of running through some housekeeping. So first up, if there's a fire, I mean, that would be terrible, but the Baltic are great at, at sorting that out. There's fire exits at the back and at the side, so don't worry about that. Um, also, there's toilets out the front, guys on the left, girls on the right. Um, and if you're using social media tonight, please use the hashtag SPAN17. And if you're not, why not? You have to. Please do. We're counting on you guys to populate the feed. We've got to beat Pittsburgh. I mean, they're nothing compared to Newcastle and Gateshead. So anyway, amazing quotes, feeds, whatever you've got. We'd love to hear about it. That's part of it, right? The idea of SPAN is about community, so please contribute. 
Um, you might need the internet to do that. Um, Wi-Fi is span 2017, and the password is lowercase Google Design. And all of the info on the schedule tonight is on g.co forward slash span 2017, if you forget. But I'm sure what I'm going to take you through is so compelling, you'll never forget that, right? Here we go. So before we start, I want to talk to you very briefly about It's Nice That. Has anyone heard of It's Nice That? Yeah, a few people know it. Thanks, good. Um, that makes this a bit easier. And really, our mission with It's Nice That is to champion creativity in all its forms and bring that to a really broad audience. So that's really it. It started as a one-week university project 10 years ago at Brighton University, and now we reach over a million and a half people every single month. Um, the key and the reason that I love It's Nice That and I still work It's Nice That every single day and I'm excited to do that is the range of things that we cover, right? We don't want to be a graphic design magazine. We want to be a creativity magazine. So we cover everything from moving image to animation to architecture um, to art to fashion and film in our own way to film, like I said. This is one of our most viewed things. <laughs> Lovely little guy. Always gets a laugh. He gets way more laughs than I do. Um, product design, graphic design, of course, illustration, tech, interactive, miscellaneous things. That's kind of my favorite category, and it's nice that. Um, photography, publications, and a whole heap more, right? So it gives you the idea of what I think is so special about it's nice that and why I'm so excited to have so many interesting people in one room. We put that stuff online mainly on it's nice that.com, um, which I hope you're aware of. We also have a biannual magazine that we publish, um, and we do events like this. And I guess because we're doing an event, they're the most important bits, right? Um, so enough about us. That's definitely not why you came here to listen about It's Nice That. I wanted to take you through why we're here. Why are we in Newcastle and Gateshead? We normally, um, I guess, hole up in London, and we're, we're stuck in our own little London bubble. Why are we here in Newcastle and Gateshead? Um, and basically, we've been collaborating with Google Design for the past few months to help them bring Span here. Um, and continue that mission they have this year of reaching cities where art and science, design, technology intersect in new and intriguing ways. Um, that felt especially relevant during our research for Newcastle and Gateshead because it's a region with so much amazing creativity happening. Um, so really, as we were looking at different cities in the UK that, that weren't London, there was an embarrassment of riches here that we couldn't ignore and an amazing heritage and history. So um, that's really, really, really why we came here. It was a very, a very easy choice. Um, when you walked in, I want to give you a bit of context. When you walked in, you would have heard the, the soundscape and the visualizations on the wall. Um, what they were is we've been here all afternoon um, working with some amazing talent from the Northeast to create these amazing, we went on these immersive um, walks and collected data and had soundscapes and understood the surroundings that we're in. Um, and then we basically mapped that data visually what you will see on the walls and you'll be able to experience it again at, at half time. So um, they, they are, those, those bits of data, those visualizations are representations of, listen to this, ready? Different combined airborne microscopic pollution particles and recordings of ambient city sounds. There you go. Woo! Um, basically we collected some data on a field walk and it was great. Um, but the goal of them really is to shine a light on environmental challenges that Newcastle and Gateshead have faced from the Industrial Revolution, but also showcase the incredible creativity happening here today. They were produced by Novak, a creative studio who you'll hear more from at the end, Urban Observatory, an amazing um, innovative data collection thing happening here in Newcastle, James Rutherford, Ed Carter, Tim Shaw, all in association with us and Google Design. Um, and I think they're a great representation of how creativity can make data and, um, I guess, information really, really super accessible. So here we are. You saw them. Um, so that brings us back nicely to here, really, is that that's, that's the point. That's why we're here, right? To champion creativity and to allow those conversations to happen and bring it to amazing audiences like yourselves. So without further ado, here we go. So this is what's going to happen tonight. Um, you've seen the first two. Next, we're going we're gonna to have two speakers. Um, then we're going to have a little break, have a few more beers. Then we're going to have another two speakers, and then we're going to have a few more beers. Sound good? Um, so... That just leaves me to hand over to our first speaker. He's an artist creating context-specific musical compositions and interdisciplinary artworks for a whole host of incredible clients and institutions. He's worked with us um, this afternoon on the visualizations. His name is Ed Carter. Please give him a massive warm welcome. Ed. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great fun day, actually. It's been really good. Uh, so I'll probably press the wrong button on this to get things started. Ah, 
there's a surprise. <laughs> and I start. So um, I'm Ed Carton, and, uh, and uh, as I say, it's, uh, one of my areas of work is creating site-specific um, compositions and, and interdisciplinary art artworks. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in the way that architects create a sense of rhythm and dynamics in the built environment. Um, and uh, there's a, there are many people who've made this association between architecture and music over the years. Um, and I'm interested in how those observations, how those thoughts can be applied to uh, contemporary practice. Not like that. <laughs> Maybe like that. <laughs> uh, uh, and one of the most famous phrases in doing this is, uh, is this term, architecture is being compared to frozen music. And that's been attributed to both um, Johann van der Goethe and, and Frederick von, uh, von Schelling. But they were uh, by no means the first pe people to start making these, drawing these comparisons between music and architecture. Um, Vitruvius uh, said in his 10 books on architecture, music also the architect ought to understand so that he may have a knowledge of the canonical and mathematical theory. So his, from his perspective, there is a mathematical principle that underpins uh, the two disciplines and brings them together. Um, and a particularly fascinating guy, uh, Robert Flood. Uh, uh, this is um, his uh, Temple of Music. This is um, it's a, the a depiction uh, of an architectural representation of his take on musical theory. And I, I understand that that's Pythagoras in the bottom there. Um, uh, so uh, he said, music is either positional or durational. It is therefore evident that harmonic music is a discerning of measurement. So positional or durational, so it's a spatial thing or it's a temporal thing. Um, and this is obviously very influential to the architect Le Corbusier, who said, music like architecture is time and space. Music and architecture alike are a matter of measure. So he didn't really change many of the words there, but um, it was nice of him to <laughs> notice what an interesting phrase it was. Um, and so I was thinking, like, how, how, how is this? How, how can you take this forward and take something from it? And this is another phrase. This is Santiago Calatro, the, uh, the architect. And he says, I mean, it's fascinating that musical terminology, words like rhythm, meter, harmony, are also used in architecture. And so to my mind, all these things, uh, are, like all these terms, they relate to proportion, and, 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 uh, which can be expressed mathematically through, through ratios. Um, and uh, I mean, ratios in harmonic music uh, they, they create modes and scales, and ratios in architecture create proportion and scale. And that's been something that's applied widely in, in uh, lots of different um, genres throughout the world. Um, one of the most well-known people uh, who's... Uh, oh, just dropped my microphone, excuse me. Uh, who has uh, operated across these, um, across these disciplines is the architect, composer, and artist, Yanis Sinarkis. Um, he, um, he bridged arguably bridge these disciplines in a, uh, in a way that no one else has, uh, has managed to achieve. Um, but his principle was very mathematical. Uh, it was, uh, and he says here, the Pythagorean concept of numbers affirmed that things are numbers or that all things are furnished with numbers or that things are similar to, to numbers. And I think as we do more and more creative practice based on digital media and more and more digital storage, it's very hard to argue that things that can't be furnished with numbers at the very least, I think it's a fairly strong case. So this is um, one of Zanarkis' most famous structures. It's the Philips Pavilion that he did when he was working under Le Corbusier. But for me, one of the most interesting things is that he used the same mathematical principles in creating the graphic score for his composition, Metastasis, which was then it was created as an orchestral piece of work. Um, and then, he, uh, as computer technology moved forward and he was able to do so, he developed the UPIC system. It was a, a graphic notation system for creating his composition. So he really did try and bridge architecture, composition, and visual art and bring them all together, but always through his approach to uh, mathematical principles. But in terms of my own approach, um, it's summarized quite nicely by um, a French philosopher, Henri, Lef Henri Lefebvre. Um, and he wrote a book called Rhythm Analysis. And in there it says uh, that the ryth rhythm analyst is always listening out, but he does not only hear words, discourses, noises, and sounds. He's capable of listening to a house, a street, a town, as one listens to a symphony, an opera. Of course, he seeks to know how this music is composed and who plays it and for whom. And in terms of... Um, uh, what I'm going to move forward with, he says this phrase, everywhere where there's an interaction between a place, a time, and an expenditure of energy, there is a rhythm. 
And so I started thinking about rhythm throughout how I developed my own projects. And it took me back to um, an example that I've, um, I've thought about and talked about a few times. And this is, uh, I, I thought back to how I first thought about making sound. And I used to think, when I was uh, a child driving along in, our, in, in the car, when we were going somewhere, uh, I would look at the road ahead and uh, I, would, I, would have, I, I would do that, that process that I think Henri Lefebvre was talking about, and think about rhythms and stuff as you walk past them. <laughs> Uh, and so in this, in this example, I suppose, going back to his, his terminology, the place is the section of road, the expenditure of energy is the car moving along it, and the time is the duration it takes to go along that stretch of road. So as I was doing this, I would uh, think of it, though, as a, as a waveform and think of that shadow as a, as a, uh, probably as a low-pass filter with a low frequency on the left and high on the right, and I'd make that sound with my mouth, and uh, that was always really popular in the car, as you can imagine, uh, for long journeys. Uh, and I thought, if I can be this annoying with the three people around me, maybe I can do it as a job. Uh, and that's <laughs> and so here's one of the examples of doing that. Um, and this is a project. Uh, of a, I wanted to do something simple. I was working with with Novak again, and this is for the BAFTA headquarters at 195 Piccadilly for a, uh, a projection mapping they were doing for Lumia London. And I wanted to do something where I took the architecture of the building and uh, represented that rhythmically for the opening section of this composition. Uh, and so for quite a simple example, uh, I looked at the bays of the windows and um, on the first floor, so the green is, uh, I saw the rhythm as one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. And the purple is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And that was the starting point for the composition. And that sounded like this. Um, and so, um, and, and similarly, we uh, did a, another project uh, together at Singapore Art Museum. Um, and in this instance, um, I wanted to do something similar, but I noticed when seeing the architecture of the building that I thought the architect applied the golden ratio um, rectangle really uh, uh, with a lot of repeats throughout the building, because this is only actually the sec centre section of the building. It was a big arch that sort of spanned all the way around the audience. Um, and so I did a similar thing with this and looked at it in golden ratio terms and then used the proportions of these rectangles and their positions to, to dictate the rhythms and also the relative notes that were being triggered within the composition. And then playheads again moved across the building both horizontally and vertically. So again, the place is the architecture, the, the location, and then the expenditure of energy in this instance, in Lefebvre's terms, is these playheads moving across the building and then the time is the amount of time these playheads take, which is something that you can choose and select and, and apply to the, the architecture in due course. So this is another project uh, which kind of had a similar starting point. Um, it, it was first commissioned for Sage Gateshead next door and then also uh, at the, the Lowry in Salford. And this also took um, architectural proportions um, as the starting point for a composition. Um, but also I wanted to do something f to capture something a bit more about that intangible thing of ex what, about atmosphere, about the, 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 the experience of entering a building. And so um, this is a great building for doing the, the structural uh, comp um, the structural, the 3D sequencer, I suppose. Uh, the architect Michael Wilford had, had based the structure on a number of geometric shapes, which immediately gives loads of syncopated rhythms from the three-sided, four-sided, and six-sided shapes, all creating their own patterns as they overlay each other. And so this sounded like this.
but as I said, I also wanted to apply um, a different source. I didn't want it just to be about the architectural form. I wanted to think about what the architecture had tried to create in terms of experience. And as an analogy for that, I, I took barometric pressure readings with a mechanical barograph over the course of eight weeks in this instance, and used them again as a graphic score, um, as a second melody as part of the, the final performance. And so that was then uh, scored for a string quartet. And so returning to uh, Henri Lefebvre, um, this idea of an interaction between a place, a time, and an expenditure of energy, I was thinking, uh, how can you, uh, like, that's an interesting uh, approach, and how can you apply it beyond architecture? Does it relate to uh, a, broader, um, a broader, uh, broader set of contexts, different types of projects? And so I, I thought back to other projects I've done. So this is the False Lights of Durham, which was commissioned uh, for the Random Acts uh, for Channel 4. Uh, and the concept behind this was about um, a period uh, as the first electric lighthouses were installed along the northeast coastline. And they were, um, took 10 of these lights, and the concept was about looking back at, uh, from sea, because there, was, it was there were a huge number of shipwrecks along that coastline until the electric lighthouses were installed. Um, so in this instance, the, the place was uh, conceptually looking back from a boat, looking back at, um, at, the, uh, at the coastline. Um, the, uh, the energy was the lights flashing, and the time was based on the fact that obviously all lights have, uh, they have, all have distinctive characters, uh, so you can identify where you are along the coastline. So each lighthouse has its own rhythm inherent, inherent within it. So in terms of uh, what, rather than the architecture being the the data source. In this case, it was the 1890 list of lights, which uh, you can get hold of and find out what, if you, next time you need to know what lighthouse flashing rhythm you have near, nearby 100 years ago, that's where you go to. <laughs> and it was installed as a, as a, um, a 10 light installation and, and a choral composition. Um, so uh, that was uh, so. In that instance, the composition and the lighting was uh, taken from the exact same uh, data source, and each uh, each light and each note was related back to this um, this data set, I suppose. And so another project uh, which was uh, local, right out the front of here, actually on the River Tyne, uh, was Flow, which was a collaboration in 2012 with Owl Project, who make these incredible um, wooden uh, electronic instruments. Um, and the concept behind this was looking at the cyclical nature of the river and that, the cyclical nature of our relationship with our waterways. Um, and again, uh, there's, there's this underpinning thing of what the place in this instance, going back to Lefebvre, the place is the River Tyne. The expenditure of energy is the tidal river moving underneath the tide wheel to power the instruments. 
and the, and the the time is the amount of time it takes and and the amount and, and how that and how those things are all interwoven so this idea of place time and energy expended can be applied really to a broad range of contexts and i've thought about it in terms of all the other projects so whether it's relating to the chronology of um uh of, of the experiences of people who are involved in a lifeboat disaster uh, in, in Siam and, the, and an instrument and composition that was based on that, um, about the death of cancerous cells in a collaboration with Northern Institute for Cancer Research. Uh, or um, in this instance, it was um, uh, smoke signals, which was um, uh, based on email interactions. And for anyone who's interested, working with smoke uh, to represent data is a fantastic analogy because it really is the case that the more smoke you put in, the less evident any information becomes because you can't <laughs> see anything. <laughs> um, so uh, there's always this, uh, this, 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 this idea, as Lefebvre says, the, the place, the time, and the energy expended, and it creates an image. And even if that energy expended is just the movement of an eye across a page. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the energy expended was changes to the landscape. It was a, a commission for ordnance survey um, uh, based on the change. Working with uh, the architect, Nicky Kirk, we worked together to create this structure. Um, and so why, why is this of interest to me, this idea of like place, time and energy expended being uh, sort of how the, the fact that it can be interpreted as rhythm, why do I find that interested? And I think I'm interested in it because I think place and time and energy are also the underpinnings of providing a context for anything. And obviously without any context, pretty much any information is, is meaningless. And so I suppose, um, I suppose for me, uh, there's this idea of rhythm and context uh, are really the underpinnings of all the projects I try to do, and they kind of provide the fundamentals of, um, of the narrative that really is um, what most of my work is about. So thank you very much for listening. Ed, thank you so much. So philosophy, architecture, sound, and data... It's just what you're expecting, wasn't it? So anyway, right, our next speaker is the director of the New Bridge Project, an artist-led hub supporting the creation of new pioneering contemporary art practice. Um, they've also just excitingly opened up a new space in Gateshead around the corner. To hear more, please welcome Charlie Gregory. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Charlie, I'm director of the Newbridge Project based here in Newcastle. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do at Newbridge and some of our projects that I thought might be relevant tonight. Uh, but first I was going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I moved here to study fine art at Newcastle University. I graduated eight years ago now, even though it feels like it was still only two. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, in that time, I've really seen Newcastle grow and change a lot in, in the 12 years I've lived here. And when I graduated, I, probably like a lot of other people, had literally no idea what I was going to do with my degree. Um, I decided to remain in the region, um, but, there, but there were only a small number of opportunities for emerging artists at that time. And we found it really difficult to find affordable workspace. And I just couldn't figure out how you get on that ladder and how you kind of break through into, into the, the art world as such. Now I look around Newcastle and it's filled with numerous artist-led collectives, DIY maker groups, grassroots spaces, and it's creating a really exciting and vibrant place to be. And instead of automatically relocating to London, I see lots of artists remaining in the region, using our city as a base to work from to develop their practice and grow their national and international careers from the northeast. And why is this? What, what has changed? There are affordable workspaces for creatives now. There's, there's loads of them, actually. And there are spaces to experiment and test out ideas. But most importantly... There's a real thriving creative community to be part of. And I'd like to think Newbridge has, has played a role in that. So the Newbridge Project is an artist-led community. It's based in Newcastle City Centre. And it was set up in 2010 by two fine art graduates from Newcastle University. Starting out life in Norham House, a five-storey office block, it grew from the desire 
and the need to create truly affordable workspace for artists and makers in the city centre and generate a supportive community, a place where artists and creatives could work and make, but also meet, socialise and collaborate. So at the beginning of, the, beginning of this year, we, we moved house, we moved to Carlyle House, and like many grassroots spaces, we occupy buildings that await redevelopment, meanwhile spaces. And these spaces, because of their peppercorn rent, they allow artists the necessary conditions to experiment and often to continue to practice. And since 2010, many more groups and initiatives have adopted a similar model to Newbridge and have inhabited buildings within Newcastle City Centre, generating a real genuine creative hub, a critical mass of makers and thinkers all based in one square block in the city centre, and that's the East Pilgrim Street site, just, just at the bottom of Northumberland Street. Now, an important element of Newbridge is that we are artist-led. All our initiatives and our programmes are shaped by and for the artists that they aim to support. Our vision is one that is shared. It's collective. And Newbridge has grown organically, not by design or from policy, but from the needs and desires of artists. And we support artists in three main ways. Firstly, through space. We provide affordable studio and workspace to over 80 artists working across disciplines. Our spaces provide flexibility to experiment and to push boundaries, to be brave and not be constrained by commercial motivations only. Our building is equipped with a dark room, with tilt wood workshop, hands-on film lab, and numerous project and rehearsal spaces. All of these initiatives are run and shaped by the artist members themselves. And we also provide co-work and communal space, helping to nurture that creative community. Secondly, through the artist development programme, through our artist development programme. So Practice Makes Practice focuses on developing artistic talent, equipping artists with the necessary skills to manage their practice, helping to bridge that gap between university, between art school, the studio, the workplace, the gallery, and beyond. It's a regular programme of events, workshops, opportunities, talks, field trips, socials, exchanges, ment and mentoring, creating a forum for shared learning, for critical conversations to happen, and for alternative models of practice to start developing. From basic things such as how to set up as self-employed, to potluck meals, on workshop to workshops on how to sonify dry ice. And thirdly, through our exhibition and commission programme. We provide space outside of an institutional framework and traditional gallery setting to experiment, to test bed ideas and to act as a springboard, giving a platform to regional artists to exhibit alongside international and national artists, creating the space to make work and the framework to speak about it critically. And all of this is shaped by our studio members. The programme is res responsive and it reflects diverse interests. So from projects such as Urban Organisms that explore the environmental and political dimensions of urban food production and consumption, to projects such as Thin Air by Stefan Levering and Leah Miller, Leah Miller a series of large-scale projections exploring the practice of filmmaking through working with extreme retinal and sonic scenarios. Levering used a lensless camera to explore the physical and technological limits of the video. To projects such as The Regeneration Game by Baz, a live game show based on the classic generation game with a little bit of a twist. So The Regeneration Game explored the seedy business of inner city regeneration through the format of a, of a game show and looked at the role played by artists within this, complete with a conveyor belt that was powered by an artist riding a fixed gear bike. <laughs> to projects such as Transparent by Polish artist Konrad Smolenski and Honza Zimowski, 
which featured a specially designed and fabricated large-scale treadmill for eight performers to walk on daily as part of a precisely scripted sc scenario of live actions which explored rhythm, order, and vibration. To the largest project that we delivered to date, Hidden Civil War, which took the form of a month-long festival where we worked with over 90 artists and activists. And it saw us move out of the gallery space and into the public spaces of the city. The project aimed to expose, collate, and present evidence of a hidden civil war happening in Britain today. And Hidden Civil War included over 20 events, an exhibition, a film festival, a newspaper across seven venues and 12 public sites, engaging over 600,000 people. And again, we worked with all of our studio members to, to shape this program and to curate it. To a recent commission that we delivered in partnership with the Lang Art Gallery. Now, this is a bit of a mouthful, so... Echoes of Abstraction 2 and the Bottomless Pit of Outros. Go, got it out. It saw us commission four regional artists, Adam Goodwin, Jamie Cook, Paul Trickett, and James Pickering, working under the Occasion Collective. And they created a transdisciplinary installation in the Lang Art Gallery, featuring physical installations, virtual reality, and interactive sound. The installation was responsive to and incorporated pieces from the Lang's modern and contemporary painting collection as well. So I asked Adam before this talk to describe the intention behind the project and he said, we started out with the idea of just wanting to make The Sims real. And the exhibition contained three domestic sets installed in the gallery, a bathroom, a kitchen and a bedroom. And these three sets were each designed in a video game engine. They were then recreated and rebuilt in, physical in the physical space of the gallery, including every imperfection and unlifelike characteristic which was in the virtual model. Attempting to recreate the digital world in the physical. And the outcome was something that was slightly adjacent to reality, creating a feeling that something was just not quite right and resulting in an augmented sense of reality. And each set incorporated the works from the Lang's permanent collection, all from the abstraction movement. Placing them in these domestic spaces allowed them to be viewed and interpreted in new ways, giving a sense of ownership to the viewer. And the show started to ask, how can we move ideas of abstraction that were historically being explored in a painterly fashion into a conversation with the digital world? Each of the domestic spaces was reinvented in virtual reality. The VR environment mapped the exact, exact visual and dimensional properties of the physical spaces, bridging that gap between the digital and the real world. Each VR environment responded to the materials and objects in each of the rooms. For example, the bathroom played with ideas of water and nautical paraphernalia, and when wearing the VR, it felt as if the room was suspended in the ocean. The VR allowed the impossible to happen in the gallery setting. Elements begun, began to fly around the room and float in space. Objects were endlessly dripping and the floor started to take on properties of water. Elements such as the still lives and objects from the painting were also, from the paintings were also reappropriated and reanimated and then abstracted into the VR. And the paintings dictated each environment. The kitchen became a non-world and the bedroom was floating in space. The exhibition was also used as a set for a film by the four artists. The film sought to reimagine artificial intelligence source code. The script was written by AI chatbots talking to each other. And the outcome was pages and pages long, mostly understandable conversation with occasional left field tangents. So at one point, the chatbots started uh, quoting Queen lyrics to each other for quite a long time. 
And the actors then played the chatbots within, this, within the gallery installation, using these physical sets as film sets. The actors read from the script directly. They then started to respond through physical movement and free improv to an audio playback of the reading. And this process was used to start to try and imagine a route to transhumanism. And the final act of the film representing AI breaking through the Turing test. So I'm going to play a short uh, clip of the film. It's still work in progress, so this is a bit of a sneak peek. So what is next for Newbridge? Uh, we have recently launched a new graduate program, graduate development program that is in partnership with Newcastle University called The Collective Studio. And The Collective Studio will support 20 recent graduates each year from across creative disciplines. This year's cohort is made up of creative writers, visual and digital artists, artists, experimental sound artists, curators, architects, filmmakers, photographers, and designers. It will follow an educational philosophy that advocates learner-chosen activities, preparing the individuals for an uncertain and rapidly changing future. And the ultimate aim is, is to create a collective, a supportive and vibrant community of cross-disciplinary practitioners who will shape their own learning and generate a culture of peer support and collaboration. And this will all be based in our new space in Gateshead, which is just up the road on the high street, which is being built right now, uh, as you can see. Um, so it's quite exciting for us to have a space on this side of the river as well as our space in, Gate in Newcastle. And the new bridge project Gateshead will open next Friday. Friday the 13th, I'm sure nothing possibly will go wrong, <laughs> uh, with a new exhibition called Reality Check, and that features eight early career artists that have undertaken our pilot graduate program in partnership with the university as well. And of course, you are all welcome to, to come along next Friday at 6 p.m. <laughs> Little plug there. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to finish on one last point. When I was invited to talk here this evening, um, my first reaction, I've got to be honest, it was, oh, I work in the visual arts. What, what contribution do I have to make to technology and design? And while deciding what to present tonight, I realized that actually so much of what we do and, and the work we do is, is rooted and influenced in technology and design practices to the hidden and practical applications, to the more obvious ways in which we use technology and, and how it is changing the very landscape of our interactions and culture explored through the work of the Echoes of Abstraction project. And I think visual art is not separate to technology and design, it is responsive to it, and it also influences it, and it's embedded within its practice. It allows audiences to engage in new multidisciplinary ways, and it changes the processes of creation and distribution. It provides us with new tools for expression, and it generates new art forms all the time. And we cannot exist as a singular sector. It is integral that artists investigate and respond to the social, to the environmental, technological, and political world around us defining new paradigms of expression and taking us where we expect at least and ultimately changing the way we feel and the way we think. Thank you.
Charlotte, thank you so much. Um, right, time for a little break now, but before you go, before you start shuffling around, remember, Span is about collaboration, so you have my um, complete permission to grab a drink, take in the visuals, and go and speak to someone you've never spoken to before and see if there's something you can do together. Um, whatever you decide to do, though, use the hashtag Span17, and we will see you back here at 8.45. Thank you very much. The current way of doing things was clashing in all kinds of ways because we hadn't been thoughtful about the physics of it. Why don't we take that and run with that a little bit and see if we could figure out, you know, what is this made of? What is the material that our software is made of? If in the real world we build expectations for how something will behave because we have a mental model of what it is, how do we start to build expectations in the user's mind about how a digital surface The current way of doing things was clashing in all kinds of ways because we hadn't been thoughtful about the physics of it. Why don't we take that and run with that a little bit and see if we could figure out, you know, what is this made of? What is the material that our software is made of? If in the real world we build expectations for how something will behave because we have a mental model of what it is, how do we start to build expectations in the user's mind about how a digital surface will behave when we don't have a preconceived notion of it. We don't know what it's made of. With the advent of smartphone technologies and displays, we have paper resolution in our devices. And so paper is just a natural, space, natural place to start for material, but our paper wasn't paper. It's digital. Um, it's just pixels. John came up with the idea of smart paper, quantum paper. And that idea of it being mostly paper-like served as a rallying cry and as a kind of a mental and emotional focal point for the whole initiative. Material is the metaphor in the sense that physical objects have physical properties. To take that and say, software has mass. If we can build on that, then we can get people to a point where they're sort of effortlessly using software and, and it feels elegant to them. Your users, on the other end of your application, they're not here to experience your application. They're just trying to get through their day. And anytime they get tripped up by something that doesn't work the way they expect it to, you know, that's your failure. All of the motion graphics and all of the visual design in terms of shadowing and depth and layers, those are all there in service to give you some cues about where things live, how things are organized, what's the hierarchy, and that's in service of the usability. All the traditional design disciplines that we typically associate with physical goods, they've reached a certain status in terms of of beauty. And software design is extremely young. At some point, and the point's not too far from today, um, designing digital interfaces is, is going to really have the full range of surface material quality that industrial design has today. We've gotten to a point where software becomes an omnipresent tool in your life, as, as, as present as the chair or the clothes that you wear. And I think that raises the bar significantly on people's expectations for even just the aesthetics of the tool, um, the beauty of it. We've only just gotten to the point where we could begin to deliver on those expectations.
it was really important for us to have a type system that had flexibility. We have a lot of different weights and different widths to serve all of the different places that we need. We don't just have a bold title and regular text. We can be much more subtle by going with a medium weight for the title. For a very large display, we can use the thinner or the lighter weight. It's a step beyond what we're used to in a lot of UI type systems where there's just a bold and a regular. Historically, Roboto had a very small counter on the top of the R. It's subtle, but it gives it more of a serious character. As we wanted to make it more friendly, we opened up the R here. You don't think of characters as having postures, but they kind of do, right? So this was our last R, and then now we're more relaxed. We did something similar with the lowercase a as well. The little loop down there at the bottom opened up a little bit more. The, the curved sides of the D or the O, going from square dots to the rounded dots. All of those little details together add up to a different feeling. It became more approachable and more friendly. We also wanted to add the typographic niceties that we're used to seeing in print. For the italics, what are the optical illusions that happen when you slant letters, and how do we correct those? You can see things like the characters that are round are actually slanted a little bit less. All of those little things help to compensate. The result is a typeface that works in a lot more environments. One of the unique things about designing for digital environments is that you can update the types. And we really see Roboto as a living typeface. As needs change and as we introduce new form factors, as we need it to do more things, we can continue to revise it, continue to update it, and really tune it for what it's purposed for. こんにちはスパンへようこそ今日はお忙しい中来ていただきどうもありがとうございます It's all about cities. I think, I think countries are an outdated format. I think cities are where it's at and nobody bothers about the boundaries. Design crosses all these boundaries seamlessly. 実際の建築においてもそういう,こう多様な解釈を誘うデザインっていうのを心がけて,がけていますえっ、ー、とまあ我々のその今のデジタルベースのコミュニケーションの基本になってるのはタイポグラフィーそのコミュニケーションの何にフォーカスをするのかどんなことをそぎ落とされるのか例外もありますがどんなコミュニケーションが生まれるかはツール次第なんです。I think material design should help you free up your time so that you're spending more time on the conversations you want to be having. Design is always evolving. We're constantly learning about user behaviors and finding new ways to improve our products. We're fascinated by the fact that design never stands still. And sometimes the world seems to be going faster and faster and faster. And yet, at the same time, people buy magazines because people still love those material things. As publishers, I think we aim to create something that truly is so different that you'd want to keep forever. やっぱりあの冒険に出かけただけでも、えーまあ、それで何も作らないんだったらそれでその冒険が終わるんだけどやっぱりいい制作物いい作品を作ると、まあ、その冒険を感じることとかは、まあ、これからまあ続いていくんじゃないかということを気づきました。What you see here is always a recombination of the things the network was trained on. This particular network was trained on pictures of animals and insects, and so what you get is these crazy recombinations of animals and insects. So, this is now kind of a hybrid of things that the machine came up with and that I came up with.、Um, and the result is kind of a weird collaboration between machine and human. In animation, you have, I mean, 200 to 300 milliseconds of. 
time to have a transition happen. So what in there can you make not feel symmetrical, not feel mechanical, but feel organic and natural? I think those details in there can be very powerful. コンピューターにはコンピューターにしかない良さ、面白さ、手作業には手作業でしかないできないことがあることをこの展示を通して再認識できました。We all are just kind of social animals. We like to hang out, we like to see and be seen. And I think that's what these projects all try to highlight. You don't hear about artists and designers at NASA because it never existed before. So mostly I work in mission formulation where I help engineers and scientists design and brainstorm new missions using design thinking. You really have to become a versatile designer. You got to show them storytelling, it's illustration, really introduce and get JPL's feet wet in design and art in general. Storytelling and narrative, it really allows a user and audience to be connected to the thread and the big message of what you're doing. So it's a really important mission formulation because the public needs to know why this is important. We have so many things to discover. It's an endless exploration expedition. There are no wrong colors. What matters most is how you use them. But with such a broad spectrum to choose from, how do you know which colors will work for you? The Material Design Palette provides a simple, smart approach to building with color. Starting with the primary 500s, it scales from light to dark, offering a variety of carefully chosen values. These color ranges are then applied to different elements in the UI. The 500s are perfect for describing the dominant theme in your product and are great for toolbars. From there, scale up to the 700s for status bars or down to a 300 for secondary information. Accent colors are brighter and more saturated. They encourage user interaction, giving your UI subtle but considered color pops. They are perfect for highlighting primary action buttons or fabs, standard buttons, switches, sliders, and more. This system for thinking about color is powerful, immersive, and completely adaptable to any application. Whether your brand is poppy and bright or serious and subdued, material design makes color work for you. Start building. Get to know the fundamentals of color on google.com slash design. We just spun out as an independent company only last year, um, and since then we've launched Pokemon Go, which has been a great success. We're really trying to improve the relationship, I guess, between these devices like phones with the person using them to enhance and create a healthier lifestyle pattern. Our team is constantly looking for opportunities to find interesting mixes of the real world and the fictional world. Um, you're out in the real world, you're interacting with real objects and real people, but we're trying to create a really compelling experience where you're going outside more, interacting with other people and your family. In some sense, it's already working. current way of doing things was clashing in all kinds of ways because we hadn't been thoughtful about the physics of it. Why don't we take that and run with that a little bit and see if we could figure out, you know, what is this made of? What is the material that our software is made of? If in the real world we build expectations for how something will behave because we have a mental model of what it is, how do we start to build expectations in the user's mind about how a digital surface will behave when we don't have a preconceived notion of it? We don't know what 
it's made of. With the advent of smartphone technologies and displays, we have paper resolution in our devices. And so paper is just a natural, space, natural place to start for material, but our paper wasn't paper. It's digital. Um, it's just pixels. John came up with the idea of smart paper, quantum paper, and that idea of it being mostly paper-like served as a rallying cry and as a kind of a mental and emotional focal point for the whole initiative. Material is the metaphor in the sense that physical objects have physical properties. To take that and say, software has mass. If we can build on that, then we can get people to a point where they're sort of effortlessly using software and, and it feels elegant to them. Your users on the other end of your application, they're not here to experience your application. They're just trying to get through their day. And anytime they get tripped up by something that doesn't work the way they expect it to, you know, that's your failure. All of the motion graphics and all of the visual design in terms of shadowing and depth and layers, those are all there in service to give you some cues about where things live, how things are organized, what's the hierarchy, and that's in service of the usability. All the traditional design disciplines that we typically associate with physical goods, they've reached a certain status in terms of, of beauty. And software design is extremely young. At some point, and the point's not too far from today, um, designing digital interfaces is, is going to really have the full range of surface material quality that industrial design has today. We've gotten to a point where software becomes an omnipresent tool in your life, as, as, as present as the chair or the clothes that you wear. And I think that raises the bar significantly on people's expectations for even just the aesthetics of the tool, um, the beauty of it. We've only just gotten to the point where we could begin to deliver on those expectations.
Just, just talk amongst yourselves while we, while we sort the projector. Thanks. Right, never in doubt, was it? Um, so, our third speaker... Um, sorry, welcome back. That was very rude of me, wasn't it? Welcome back. Um, did you have a nice drink? Yeah. Yeah? Excellent. Did you, did, you look very rested, actually. You look, you look, you look ready. Um, and you need to be ready for this next one. So next up, we have... <laughs> don't say, oh, God, Jimmy. <laughs> next up, we have graphic artist, video director, whose work combines handmade collage, Drawing, painting, and screen printing. More importantly, he's a firm, it's nice that favourite, um, and also one of the most lovely men you could ever meet. Please give it up for Jimmy Terrell. Hi guys, how's it going? How's it going? This accent is from here, it's from this city, Newcastle. Newcastle. Um, what about the, where's the little mic thing, the other thing? That's it. Why I, man? Because that's the first thing when you go to London. I lived in London for the last 15 years. You go down there and people say, hey, man, you're from the Toon, yeah? Going down the Toon to drink a bottle of Brune, yeah? Why I, man? And, uh, yeah, I'm sort of sick of it a little bit, but um, this is a project I've done with this nice start about round the Baker Wall, which we'll come to in a second. Um, and basically, yeah... I thought I'd split the talk into three parts. The first part being like a general, in, general intro to myself and where I'm from and how I got started, my influences, my techniques, and a couple of huge clangers that I dropped along the way, um, yeah, which will actually turn out to be blessings in disguise in a, in a weird way. Um, the second part is a typography project I've done with It's Nisa and Fon Smith that was dis, uh, inspired by the Baker Wall where I grew up. Um, and then third part is the campaign that I've just created for Beck's new album, uh, Colours, which is released next week, plug, um, which uh, involves creating all the artwork and directing both... The, how do I do this bit, yeah? Do I just, do I just press? That's it. So that's the first lyric video I've I, I done uh, for WOW, the track WOW. I, I directed that one, and then I just did this one for um, a track called Dear Life, which is a, a lot more kind of cinematic, photographic... Um, yeah, and it's, it's a, a lot more simple, basically. So, yeah, this is the intro. Um, I grew up on a bike, a wall. Uh, generally an amazing place to be a kid growing up. Um, that's me and my dad. Um, yeah. And um, this, is, this is, growing up as a jury, you realise the difference between um, the dream and reality. So this is my dad telling us when I was a kid, love that ball. The ball is yours. This is your best friend in the world. You know what I mean? And you're going to... If you, if you just stick with it, you'll be the best, you'll, you'll play for the best football team the world's ever seen, which is Newcastle United, of course. Um, and it, it, that was the dream. The reality was a little bit different, though, and it, it evolved a lot of this. Crying. <laughs> uh, relegation. More crying. I love it if we beat them. Crap managers. Even crapper managers. More crying, <laughs> empty trophy cabinets. Don't even get a start on that one. St. James's, Jesus. Men fighting horses. <laughs> More relegation. The owner of the club with his belly and his moobs out. Actually, that's a joke, because that's not the owner of the club. That's ridiculous, you know what I mean? That's the owner of the club, though, with his belly and his moobs out. How did this actually happen? Do you know what I mean? Jesus Christ. So thanks, Dad. He's in the crowd there. Thanks for the dream. 
You give us a little smile for a little bit, you know what I mean? But uh, you also give us the reality. That's it there, uh, Whitley Bay Beach. Somebody says that the, the sea was quite warm that day, you know what I mean? Bang, finito. So I knew I was never going to be the next Gaza. So I just thought, hey, I'm going to just do art. I love art, you know what I mean? And I studied in Liverpool, uh, they did my graphics degree. And this is, this is the guy I first met the first day, a guy called Richard Turley. Me and my best mates, we moved in together and we started collaborating on a lot of projects. Richard's went on to do like amazing shit, basically, with um, Bloomberg Business Week and he's, he's now working at Wyden Kennedy's, but he's MTV, all these sort of great places. But we ended up, the first thing that we'd done together was the student magazine, and this is a magazine called Shout. And um, we honestly didn't have a fucking clue what we were doing, but we just tried our hardest and we completely winged it. Rich did all the tape and I did, a, did the illustrations for it. We got sacked from the magazine three times in a row. And um, the last time was basically was replacing some old boring photo that they wanted on the cover uh, with one mate in Magaluf with his eyebrows shaving off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it didn't go down too well, basically. We actually got banned from the student union for that. Um, even though we got sacked, we won the Guardian Award for like best student publication. And, um, the prize for winning was, was uh, a two weeks work experience at the Guardian. And, uh, but there was a slight, slight problem with me because all my sort of design heroes were people like Peter Kennard, um, Fuel Design, uh, Barney Bubbles, Jamie Reed, and none of them w ever switched on a computer basically. And that was the same as me. And the whole, I was, the whole three years I was at uni, I never switched on a computer. Everything was uh, obsessive kind of analog techniques, uh, photocopying, collage, screen printing, faxing even, and you know, that sort of left us up shit creek a little bit, you know what I mean? So, um, when we were at the Guardian doing our work experiences, Richard was knocking out all these spreads, I'm sat next to him with some scissors and print stick, and uh, I just looked like some little kid playing in the office, you know what I mean, just with some stuff, you know? And um, to cut a long story short, he got a job there, I ended up back in a bread factory uh, uh, called Hunters and Bakers on the Team Valley, and, uh, which felt like a slight come down. And um, my whole job was literally, the conveyor belt came along, and I, for 30 you know what shifts this was, split the door up like that, like that. And I was like, wow, man. And sometimes there wasn't even any door on the conveyor belt, so I just <laughs> sort of stood there, you know what I mean? A lot of the time. While I was at the factory, Richard phoned us up, and he's like, man, uh, I've just been given, I've been made art director of this new magazine called Seven Magazine. It was, it was, it was the weekly version of Mix Mag, the dance magazine. He said, just get your arse back to London. You can do all the illustrations in the magazine. And uh, I kind of looked at the door on the conveyor belt, and I was like, all right, yeah, I'm up for that. I'm up for that. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll pull that one off. And the favourite part of my job was basically, uh, there's a guy called Tony Marcus, who, who used to literally just go and take different drugs every week in really obscure uh, locations. And I had to do the illustrations for it. So you would be like in uh, Peru, uh, Peru doing sort of mescaline in a Peruvian mine shaft. And then sometimes in a sex dungeon in Vauxhall. And I had to come up with some ideas. And so some of them are terrifying. And then some of them are kind of euphoric. Uh, some of them are psychedelic. Some are just sort of, just bullshit, basically. And then you just come, I had to get the essence of what he was saying, basically, with tape. Um, some hand-painted stuff. Just general weird shit, basically, you know what I mean? So this went on and on, and I've done millions of them. But um, this one here, I, I, this, it was published, and then I, I got a, a phone call one day from Liam Howlett from The Prodigy on the phone. I thought it was my mate Hutchie winding us up. He just said, yeah, mate, how's it going? Oh, it's Liam from The Prodigy here, mate. Really liking his stuff, man. How's it going? Yeah. Uh, can we meet up? I want you to do the new single, man. New single, you know? I'm like, Hutch, that is such a shit accent, man. <laughs> it's terrible, man. I said, nah, man, honestly, honestly. So I eventually got around it, you know what I mean? And I couldn't believe it, man. I was in the bread factory, then I'm, six weeks later, I'm sort of designing the Prodigy covers, you know what I mean? So um, this is crazy. He, um, he gets, he, he's like, um, the tracks, he's like, yeah, man, the, the track's called Baby's Got a Temper. And the, the start of the track, it's got like, a la laughing policeman at the start, so I just want you to fucking find a laughing policeman. Just go out and find one. So I'm just like, fuck, I'm just some dude, I, you know, I, I don't know, was it laughingpoliceman.com, you know what I mean, I don't know. <laughs> so it took us ages to find this guy, and eventually I found this guy called Jeffrey in Surbiton, and he collected old fairground memorabilia, that's the way he spoke, you know what I mean. 
why don't you come to my house and I'll show you my collection? <laughs> right? So I go to down to Surbiton to meet this dude, and I swear to God, man, I get there, he opens the door, he's got all these trainer dolls on, on the wall and stuff. Come on in, Jimmy. And it was like a weird smell in there. And I'm just like, man, I'm underneath the floorboards on this one, you know what I mean? This is the last time anybody's going to see it, you know? And um, this is the weird thing. He sort of, he's got the, the laughing policeman like, under, a, under a cover in the corner. And I, he, and I was like, uh, all right, so he didn't look like a policeman, man. He looks a bit like a sailor, you know? And he was a sailor. I was need audio. The audio is terrifying, basically. I don't know, I've lost it. But uh, it's basically, ha, 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 ha. And I just thought, this is the last thing I'm ever going to see when, I, when a knife guns into my neck, you know what I mean? And I, basically what he did was he, he, he just took the outfit off the sailor and put, like, a little copper's outfit on him. And, uh, yeah, and that, that was the cover. That was the prodigy cover, basically. So this is one of the biggest calamities that ever happened to us. After that, the, the, the single done all right. The song was crap. It was the worst ever Prodigy song. Prodigy are good, man. They've done some good stuff, you know what I mean? But it was a terrible record. Still got a number four in the charts. But then Liam was like, I want you to do the album. I love what you did there. And I'd done, uh, I worked on the album for a year and a half after that. And I'd probably done like 500 different covers. And... Um, and Basically, it's sort of, um, it was all my fault, basically. I was just young and naive, and I, just, I showed him everything that I did, rather than kind of self-editing and curating a little bit. I was just almost like throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what's stuck, you know what I mean? No real structure to it. And then one day, the print deadline come up, and, and he finally chooses a cover, and uh, then I'm like just buzzing, you know what I mean? And I'm, I always remember I was on Tottenham Court Road, and I get a call, phone call from the label, and they're like, uh, Jim, I've got some bad news, man. Uh, they went with the other design. I think the other design? What, what do you mean? So say, you know, we've had, we had another designer working on it, you know what I mean? And I was just like, you know, and your world, your world just falls to bits, you know, it was just devastated and sort of um, angry, you know what I mean? Because nobody had told us, you know what I mean? But um, it was such, this is, sounds weird, but it was the biggest gift I'd, I've ever had within design, within my life, to be honest. I was depressed. It's, I went on a bit of a depression thing. Two weeks after that, Seven went bankrupt. The, mag the magazine <laughs> went for bankrupt. And I was just like, well, I, I'm back to the bread factory, man. I'm, I'm wanting to go back to the bread factory, you know what I mean? It was, I, was, I was sort of looking forward to going back there. <laughs> and um, basically what I'd done was I sort of pulled myself together and uh, to right all the wrongs which were in my practice, I knew that it was stuff that was just wrong, you know what I mean? And uh, I got, got an agent, which is a uh, heart agency, which uh, have been brilliant. I'm still with them to this day. Um, I went back to uni and I, I, I'd done a master's at St. Martin's because I had to just have a, I was stuck in a rope with this whole pro project. I had to, have to come up with a new way of thinking. And uh, I actually learned how to switch a computer on as well, which was nice, to scan things in and stuff, you know what I mean? Sort of, anyway. And, um, and then I had, like, you know, I don't know, 10 years of a successful illustration career, but I was keep coming back. When you, basically, I split with my girlfriend in London. And I was coming back to Newcastle a lot of times, and I, and I just realised, what, what am I doing? You know I mean? And I love London, you know what I mean? Didn't get us wrong. But the, the Newcastle that I'd left wasn't the one that I was keep coming back to, you know what I mean? It, amazing art scene, uh, brilliant uh, live music venues and clubs, um, great restaurants and stuff. And uh, not to be too soppy, but I was like, I just miss my family, I miss my friends, you know what I mean? And, and, I, and I moved back. And it's the best decision I've ever made, you know what I mean? <laughs> You can all start crying now if you want. Yay! Um, anyway, so this brings us... I'm out overrunning. I'm probably overrunning, but, you know. Um, brings us back to the next project. It's, and that was... This is what I've done with It's Nice, that, and Fon Smith. They asked us to create a, a typeface inspired by one aspect of the home, my hometown. So I picked the biker wall uh, where I grew up, basically. And, um, and it was kind of weird because when, in the 80s, growing up in Newcastle, you were surrounded by kind of grey... Brutalist architecture dominated. Um, do is the T Dan Smith era basically, and we were promised that we were going to be the Brasilia of the North, like an ultra uh, North uh, uh, metropolis. Basically, it just didn't fucking happen, man. <laughs> you know what I mean, uh, you had stuff like this, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, tower blocks which were just put up really quickly and cheaply, and apart from being like bad city planning, just horrible, ugly. You know what I mean? And most of it was down within like 20 years, you know, it just got pulled down. Um, 
And, and basically, you know, um, this is the old baker, basically, and, and, and which were Victorian terraces. This is where my mum used to live, and which were uh, condemned for, um, for, for being unfit for human habitation. And this guy just changed everything. He's a guy called Ralph Erskine. He was the architect, te- architect of the baker wall. All around just good dude, you know what I mean? He, very influenced by Fabianism. He was, uh, he's, he was a Quaker. And he, he built loads of stuff in Sweden, so like social democracy, and he was obsessed with the idea of kind of um, strong community within social housing. And, um, and basically, this is where I grew up, you know what I mean? And, it was just, and what he done was he, he kind of, all them terrace housing, he moved everybody from the same streets. He didn't put everybody like randomly. He put next door neighbours next door to each other in the blocks. I mean, some people probably, probably fucking hated that, to be honest, you know what I mean? You know, I'm stuck with him again, you know what I mean? But he wanted to keep communities together, basically. And um, his offices were in, he lived in the Baker Wall where he was building it. His offices were there. Um, but through a child's eyes living there, it was such a stimulating place to live because I was constantly surrounded by uh, just primary colours, geometric shapes, textures. Um, I mean, that's it from above, man. That's mental, isn't it? Is that not mental? That's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful place, man. Um, so to come back to the how, how I, in terms of the type, typography, to come up with a typeface from it, I just thought of the analogy of, of kind of breaking through the grey, uh, brutalist orthodoxy. That sounds a bit posh, doesn't it, what I just said there? Uh, and starting for that as a typeface. So what I did was I went around Newcastle and started taking photographs of brutalist buildings and what typefaces, typefaces they used. Um, and I wanted a way of interrupting what they'd done, because that's what... Erskine did, he, 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 uh, he rebelled against the, the brutalist orthodoxy of Newcastle at the time. So I found these old letters in, um, in a skip in, like, in, in, I don't know, maybe in Baker actually, I don't know. No shields. No shields. You know what we've done, Dad, actually? We pi- no, it wasn't a skip. We pinched them letters. <laughs> me, me da- I got my dad on my shoulders. We pinched them letters of the Northern Rubber Factory. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have, st- I'm going to get arrested for that, man. Um, yeah, it says it here on the thing, it's Skip in Scotswood, but uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I went online, I started buying loads of old kids' games and stuff, and then I started like, just like, combining the stuff together, you know what I mean, to interrupt the form and shape, and um, that's at the back, so I started putting stuff in the back of, in the, back of the letters. Um, these are just sort of sketchbook pages, so I start getting like kind of very kind of um, brutalist typefaces, and, and again, interrupting them. I'm um, just going through three of these. This is in my studio, just, you know, just messing around on the walls, trying to sort of, um, just, yeah, just create different stuff, you know. Oh, Jesus. I just done that. Yeah, this is all kind of on the studio walls. We went back to Newcastle. That's the street I lived in, basically. That's me with a daft smile. I love how everybody's been welcoming and put a set of out for us in the background there. <laughs> it's really nice of them, you know. The dog was pleased to see us as well. Um, and this is the final typeface, basically, uh, and we'll call it F.S. Erskine after, after Ralph, basically. Oh, oh thanks, Mum. Thanks. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so that's the final thing. Anyway, this is the next project. This is, um, this is the new um, stuff I've done for Beck, basically. So this is the first uh, single I've done from him. I'm not going to talk about this because it's, uh, it's basically... Oh, shit. How do I... How do I get that on? Doesn't matter anyway, actually, I'm not going to play it. Oh, there's two that I'm not going to get on. So basically, I've done a track called Wow. If you want to check out the, the video, check it online. Um, but this is some stuff that I've done for the album, which he basically wanted stuff very bold and simple, and he wanted a photographic route uh, rather than the analog kind of nature that we've done for Wow. Uh, these are all sketches. He's never got, never got, never got picked out, basically. Um, this is the first way we come up with this kind of hexagon idea, and I don't want to even say it, but like, um, the Beck cover is actually really influenced by Baker, because you know when you do a project and there's sort of remnants of something beforehand, so there's a bit of tune in <laughs> the new Beck cover. There you go. And Beck doesn't know that, you know what I mean? But um, so we did these different things. None of these got chosen. The whole. Um, new album is basically a, a pop extravaganza. The, fir- the album before it was acoustic and kind of esoteric. He always changes it up on every album. And then the tracks are basically designed to be played out live. And what we did here was, what I did here was, was kind of rip paper and stuff like that. He wasn't into that. He wanted it to be more kind of flown and globular and kind of more fun. 
So we kind of stopped moving towards it. He didn't like the, 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 um, the diamond shape, so we obviously went back to the hexagon. That's kind of the final cover, the deluxe cover. And um, what, what we do is, what we've done is, is kind of have, uh, we've kind of, for, for the, the, the main deluxe cover is, is kind of, it's, people can design their own cover basically by these transparencies that were created in the middle. That's a, an indie cover that we did for, uh, for uh, Rough Trade. Um, and we kept the, the, the lyric sheets very simple inside. Uh, you know, following even the, like, the lyrics, you know, following the actual shapes within, without that. This is a little... Oh, shit. How do I, how do I play stuff, guys? <laughs> eh? Click it once. Ah. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, mate. But no audio. Doesn't matter anyway. So, yeah, this is the un unboxing of it, Kenny, so you can see how it works. It's cust we wanted the, the, the viewer to sort of customise it, they're selling in a lot of ways. So that's that. And then um, this is the new, thanks, mate. This is the new um, video I've just done for him, which is kind of Dear Life, which was, he wanted it to be the opposite of Wow. He wanted it to be very influenced by the album cover. So we went for like kind of very clear, um, very simple typography. Uh, you know, um, using sort of um, geometric shapes. And we just shot it. This was shot in five days, the whole thing. And this was like, while we shot in eight days, and this was shot in five days, and this was like literally the worst experience of my life ever. <laughs> Sorry, Beck, I'm putting that out there, mate. But it was, you know, it turned out all right, but it was, it was a nightmare. And this is, was it? Twice, mate. Once. This is me in the studio. That's my really organized storyboard in my studio, uh, which I've done in five days. That's at four o'clock in the morning on the very last day, basically. And the last little thing that we zoom into basically sums up uh, my life at the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's kind of it. I think I'm running over, but there you go. Oh, no, I'll show you one more thing, one more thing. Oh, there, I've got the video on now. Don't want to watch this anymore, because I know the lads are coming up. Let me just try the audio for you. That's all right. This is the actual video, but... Um, oh, am I overrunning here? Massively. Totally overrunning. Right, but <laughs> check out this. This is the new thing that me and Rich Turley have just done together. It's not going to be released until next month, but we've just done a new video for Miguel, who's one of my favourite artists at the minute. And me and Rich are back together, creating weird shit together. So, I'm Ganyem! Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Jimmy, thank you so much. That was unbelievable. Um, and sorry to our American guests who probably didn't understand a word of that. Um... So wrapping up tonight, we have one of the team at, um, at Novak who've been helping us all day. They're a studio specialising in motion design and large format video, encompassing projection mapping, installations and more than that. Um, please give a big warm welcome to Adam Finlay. Thank you. Um. Hello everyone. Uh, just before I start, I'd just like to say Jimmy moved into our building maybe, what was it, two years ago, a year ago and that, and he's just built up to have around as you can probably <laughs> see in that. Uh, no, he's thoroughly enjoyable. It's great stuff to hear from. So yeah, uh, I'm Adam Finlay. I'm Studio Director of Novak. Uh, we are, as Alex says, a studio. We're just based over in the Biscuitton Studios on Warwick Street. Um, and we create uh, mostly large format videos. So I'm just going to show you our showreel to get things started. <laughs>
So that's uh, some of our, uh, incidentally, that piece of music is by Winter North Atlantic, which is Ed Carter. I would recommend you buy that record, it's very good. Um, so just before, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects, one much earlier in our sort of career and one much more recently, that kind of touch on the evolution of how technology has kind of assisted us and sometimes hugely frustrated us, but nevertheless, um, it's good. But just before I do that, I just want to kind of touch on what we've done here today. Um, the visualizations that you saw earlier on that we created um, was a kind of step into the unknown a bit for us. Uh, most of what you saw on that showreel or you see here in some of these pictures, this is all pre-rendered content. We draw it, we design it, we model it, we animate it, it then becomes a video file and it gets presented somewhere in that. But we knew we had to do it today was, uh, if we were gonna do this thing, pull this live data, that you know, we had to use something, so we, we kind of said, so I'm first and foremost really relieved that it all worked really well, so credit to everyone who worked on it and that, but uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much to uh, all our collaborators, Ed Carter, Tim Shaw, James Rutherford, uh, the Ari, Janine, and Phil at the Urban Observatory, Dre and JH at Nosebleeds Interactive. It was a genuine collaborative effort for everyone kind of really came support and not least, it's nice that, and Google for commissioning to do it. So thank you very much. Anyway. <laughs> so, I feel like I've forgotten someone, so sorry if I have. Anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, so as you can probably see, we spend an awful lot of our time projecting onto things that weren't made to be projected onto. So the interior of St. Peter's uh, Seminary up near Helmsborough in uh, Scotland, uh, Thurston Cray in Durham Castle, um, a fort in Jersey and uh, various other places. So this is, this proves to be quite interesting and challenging for us a lot of the time. So jumping back to 2010 and in particular, somewhere a little bit closer to home here, uh, Whitley Bay. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so that's the second time that's been mentioned. It. Um, so back in 2010, um, we got commissioned to uh, create a projection mapping onto the iconic building that is the Spanish City Building. Um, and at this time, Novak were fairly early, early in our infancies, and uh, we hadn't really done any sort of, we hadn't done any proper projection mapping, certainly not any sort of large scale things. But we were really keen to do it. it you know, the, the, the medium, if you may, was quite in its infancy, and there was a lot of things. But anyway, we got this commission to do this. It was to celebrate the centenary year of this iconic building. And uh, we didn't really know what we were doing. There wasn't the, you know, there's loads of like online resources now and that. There's so many great people out there offering support and everything. There's loads of people trying to. It's a lot less than back there, and at least we didn't know who we should talk to. So anyway, we plowed on with it, and um, we were a bit unsure what to do. But so what we did, we went down to Whitley Bay. We kind of worked out roughly where we'd put the projectors, and we took a photograph. We took this photograph, and from that we drew over it, we traced on it, and that became the template that we would use to create the content for it. Um, again, we were kind of plowed on, we didn't really, we were just, I think there was always doubt, or at least it was doubt in my mind, I'm not sure about everyone else, but probably was. Anyway, um, so we were a bit unsure about if it was the right approach, we were doing the right thing, stuff like that, and uh, you know, this building is, you know, it's fairly forgiving in ways, you know, it's white, it's mostly flat, but you do have the big issue of this dome structure, which is kind of what makes it partly iconic. So without really knowing what we were doing, we, we kind of just went down and we had, we hired a couple of sort of what at the time seemed like really amazing projectors and I think they were like 1024768, which is funny because that came up in conversation with one of the tech guys back there earlier on. So evolution of technology and all that. Any, aside from that, hired a, uh, hired a van, stuck them out the back of there and pointed them at the building and kind of hoped to God. And with a little bit of help from a friend of ours, who's still a good friend of us and still does some amazing technical stuff, a guy called Andy Coates. Um, he turned up at the last minute with a fancy computer and helped us make this reality. And luckily, when we projected on it and shifted some pixels, it looked like this. Uh, we were bloody relieved, I've got to say. <laughs> anyway, so this was like just, it was a really kind of stepping off moment for us to, 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 you know, to go into that realm of doing this. We were really excited about this as a sort of a medium of what we could do. And, I suppose if I look back over these years, that was a real kind of starting point for us in many ways and how we've kind of moved forward with ourselves uh, with, as Novak. Um, I should also point out that this was shown in the December of 2010, which was freezing cold, and about two people showed up to see it and that, and we put so much effort on working on it, and we were like, it was like, were you? Excellent, thank you very much, and I really appreciate that. 
<laughs> so who's the other person? Um, so um, anyway, luckily the North Tide Tech has had some foresight. They liked the piece and they, they reshowed it a couple of times again and we managed to get some people to see that who subsequently commissioned us to do other things, which was amazing in that. But anyway, jumping forward uh, to last year, 2016, and to another seaside, English seaside town, this time Brighton. Um, and to a slightly less iconic building, I would like to say, but the Royal Pavilion, <laughs> which um, uh, Queen Victoria didn't like, apparently, I was told. Anyway, so we got asked if we'd be interested in, as you don't ask, we're interested, of course we're interested. We're, we're, you know, we're, do we want to produce, create a projection mapping to go into this building? And you know, with equal amounts of sheer excitement and joy, it was utter terror, the thought of just like, Jesus, have you seen this thing? This is nuts. Have you seen inside it? For those of you who've been inside that, it is just a crazy building. But anyway, to add to that, it wasn't just we'd like you to make some pretty pictures of it. We were teamed up with, we were commissioned by an organization called Nutcut, and uh, we were asked to produce a piece that told the narrative story about Indian soldiers who'd fought for Britain during the First World War and had ended up in the Royal Pavilion in Brighton. Uh, because it was used as a temporary hospital for these Indian soldiers. For starters, I, didn't, I wasn't even aware that Indian soldiers had fought for Britain during the First World War and that they'd gone on this journey from mostly up in the Punjab, you know, so, you know, farmers, you know, peasant soldiers, basically, who'd come down and travelled up from Marseille up through to the Western Front and, you know, suffered horrendous industries and uh, injuries, rather, and, and then ultimately ended up inside this mental building. Um, you know, they must have thought they had died, you know, and gone to some bizarre place. So the interior is quite psychedelic. However, anyway, so we had this challenge of, like, trying to tell this kind of very, you know, it's quite heavyweight, you know, it's, it's an important story that needs to be told with, you know, right and give justice in, in sorry, I'm not wording that very well, but you get, I think you get my point probably. Anyway, so slightly more advanced than what we had done previously, uh, we teamed up with a company that we work with quite frequently called QED, who are a great bunch of guys based down in Port Osbar, and um, they have a slightly crazy director who has been really fortuitous because he gets an idea in his head and he's been wanting to projection map this building for a while. And they're all about the technology. They're all about supplying the best and all media servers and all this amazing stuff. So getting to do that stuff for them is great. And uh, so Ron taking a photo of it, we got a 3D scan of it. Now this is the like high resolution model, so the whole building got scanned. And um, basically from that, from this very accurate model, we were able to extrapolate a, what's called a UV map. Any of you who work in 3D or games design or that, I'm sure are familiar with the concept of it, but for those who are not, it is essentially unwrapping a 3D model. So if you've ever wondered what the Royal Pavilion Brighton looks like unwrapped, there you go. So this, this is, so, this is one of the circumstances where it's like technology is going to, and you know, advancements and things, and how these things interact with the media service. You know, on one hand, are going to allow you to do much more greater things and be more experimental, and, and you know, know how things are going to work better and understand, because that's the big challenge we have a lot of the time is trying to know how our content is going to translate when it's put on there. So using these techniques, um, we're able to kind of. We're able to sort of apply our content to it and then wrap things back onto the models and do like pre-visualizations and things. We're also allowed to send things, and I think it enables us to just first and foremost be more creative, but be able to tell kind of like you know narrative stories and not just splashing pretty colors or something on something. We can be really intricate in that. But at the same time, you're kind of dealing with something like this and you're like, oh God, what bit's that? And you know, and Elliot, who's our creative director and who does a lot of all our illustration work and things like that must spend hours just, well, he does spend hours just drawing around things like that. But, you know, it's working out things. But ultimately, you end up being able to have, you know, your vision is realized sort of in advance. Now, there's no substitute for the real world, but it really does make a lot of difference. And because of the complexity of things, the main dome actually had its own little separate bit. So I remember Keith, who's our chief animator and uh, um, technical director spent various times trying to get it all to work into one single file and things like that and so forth. However, anyway, after using that, so we were able to ship it back down to Brighton and uh, got down there and with slightly more than just a back of a van and a couple of projectors, this is just 
one of them uh, stacks of that. They've thrown all manner of stuff at it. We presented uh, this piece at um, the Brighton Festival in 2016, and uh, it was called Dr. Blighty, and uh, that's what it looked like. And, um, <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, so it was an amazing project to work on, not without its challenges, but you know it was like a culmination of people coming together and that. So. Um, as well as us producing the visual content, working with um, our collaborators again, uh, Ed Carter, who produced some amazing music along with a chap called Shree, um, again, QED and their team who helped realize it through the technical thing, and you know, Nutcut, 1418, who supported it and everything. And sort of like in Whitley Bay, but slightly different. So we got down there, and as ever, limited budgets, wasn't loads of money to say, so we just went down for a couple of days beforehand, delivered the finals files, and then, uh, stayed for the first night. And I think about 30 or so people turned up. And we were like, oh, okay, it's not bad. And it was on for like four or five days. So we were like, okay, and off we came back to Newcastle, you know, pretty happy about things and that. And I get a text message that evening from uh, Dan, who's a senior technician at QED, and he's like, it's a shame you guys left uh, yesterday because uh, half of Brighton just turned up. <laughs> so um, we actually, I think we, I don't know if we officially closed roads. I think just people did close roads. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's just kind of to say that, yeah, how a couple of stuff moves in. Just let's say thank you for today. Adam, thank you so much. Um, so what a night. Where else could you find data, science, architecture, design, and the biker wall all in one place? Before I hand back to Damien for the final word, um, I just want to say a big heartfelt thanks to Google Design, really, for having the vision and generosity for making these kind of things happen. Um, they've been an absolute joy to work with. Also to you guys, otherwise we're, we're sat here speaking to ourselves, so um, a huge thanks to all of you for coming out. And a final big hand, really, to our, to our four speakers, to Ed, to Charlie, to Jimmy, and to Adam. Thanks. I, I want to personally thank Jimmy uh, for, I, I can't wait to read that transcript later and, and try to really <laughs> decipher what was said. Um, 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 and then one more, one more shout out about the, the, the span reader. Um, the one thing I did forget to mention is there is a poster that was designed by It's Nice That um, in, the, in the back pocket. So um, don't, don't forget to check that out as well. Um, thanks to Alex um, for emceeing tonight. And um, thanks to the entire It's Nice That crew. Rob, Olivia, um, Ali, Will, uh, Bryony, and um, yeah, it was, thanks for helping us put on a great event today. Um, and another big thank you to the rest of my, my, Google, my Google design team. Uh, a few of us are here, Corinne and Paul, Barbara on the live stream, um, and a slew of others back in New York. Um, thank you so much for being one of the best teams um, a, boy could ask, uh, a boy could ask for. It. Um, and uh, remember to share some of your, 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 your thoughts and photos uh, from this evening on social um, with using our hashtag. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook. There's a hashtag up there. Uh, <laughs> Um, we'll also be hosting all this span content on our website, design.google, um, so please check that out. There's some additional programming um, we put together on there as well. Um, and, and one more thing, you'll be getting a, a, another email from us. It's a survey. Uh, please, please fill it out. It's, uh, it's, the, the data is totally anonymous, um, but your feedback really does help us put on these types of events in the future, so um, hearing, hearing what you thought would, would be great. Um, and then, um, I guess lastly, um, our next event is in Mexico City in, in about a month, in mid-November, so um, please <laughs> um, so please follow us uh, for updates on that installment as well. So, um, yeah, and that's it. So let's, uh, let's grab another drink, and uh, thank you again. Yeah.